Welcome to worship today. A special welcome if this is your first time worshiping with the Holy Trinity community. Please take a moment and let us know you're here by completing the welcome card. You can click on the tab below the video screen or you can go to the home page of our website and you will find a place there where you can let us know you're there. Let us begin our worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed in God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We praise you, O God, for the gift of water that sustains us. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Great God in Christ, you set us free, your life to live. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. A reading from Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child are mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life. Because they considered and turned away from all transgressions that they had committed, they shall surely live. They shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is unfair. 
O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions. Otherwise, iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all transgressions that you have committed against me and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn, then, and live. Word of God, word of life. A reading from Philippians. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? They argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, I will not. 
But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you, for John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him, and even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. Sometimes people ask me, how is it possible for you to believe in a God that is so full of wrath and vengeance, who punishes his people with death, who does things like blot out Sodom and Gomorrah? When I hear people ask me that, I find it kind of strange because Well, if you read the Old Testament, you surely can find those kinds of terrible stories, those kinds of stories where God's wrath seems to be kindled and destruction happens. But if you read the whole Old Testament, if you read all of the words of the the Torah, if you read the Pentateuch, if you read all of the words of the prophets and the Psalms and Proverbs, you will find a much different story. It is not taken up with a whole bunch of retribution and revenge. It is instead a giant love story. More often than not, the Old Testament tells us a story of a God who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That's the theme we're going to worship with for the next few weeks. Steadfast love. That's a characteristic of God that you can take to the bank. Steadfast love and not arbitrary punishment is the story of the God that we find in the Old Testament. More than 200 times by my count, we are told of the steadfast love of the Lord. That's quite a story. God is a love story, a love story between God and the people that God calls, redeems, and protects. But it is often a story of unrequited love. You know, the kind of love that isn't returned. Uh, The kind of love like Forrest Gump's love for Jenny in that wonderful movie. Uh, The kind of love like Romeo for Rosalind, who is the sister of Juliet. Some note that it's kind of that Romeo is on the rebound when he runs into Juliet. It's like Rose and Jack in the movie The Titanic. It's like the songs that we know so well. Ray Charles, You Don't Know Me. Bonnie Raitt's I Can't Make You Love Me. And Taylor Swift's Teardrops on My Guitar. Unrequited love, love for someone who doesn't return the love is part of the human experience. And it is part of the story of God and God's people. Today, Jesus tells us a parable that we just heard in Matthew of two sons. A man goes to the first son and says, go out and work in the field. And the son says, no, I'm not going to do that like many sons do to their fathers and mothers, doesn't obey. But then, after some reflection, realizes that his parents love him. His father has asked him to do nothing unreasonable, and so he goes, and he does what the father asked him. He goes to a second son, and he says to the second son, go and work in the field. And the boy says, of course, Father, I love you so much. And then never goes and doesn't do it. Jesus' question is, who is the one who obeyed the Father? Who is the one who loved the Father back? The first son, all of the elders say. And they're right. His love is not unrequited, it's returned. Even though he was a little sassy to begin with, he ends up returning the Father's love by devoting himself to the father's work. The second son, not so much. His love is unrequited. 
The father asked him to obey, to do something, to be part of the family, and the son blew it off. Last week we heard the story of Jonah in the first lesson. Jonah has been asked by God to share God's love with the people of Nineveh, people whom Jonah hates. He hates them so much that rather than listening to God, he has booked passage to a faraway place called Tarshish so he can run away from God. To make a long story short, with whales and water and floods and storms, Jonah ends up finally with a great big grudge in his heart, going and doing what God asked him to do. He preaches in Nineveh the shortest sermon ever recorded in Scripture. Repent, for in 40 days the city will be cast down. And all the people repent. And then last week we heard that he goes outside the city and he sulks. He sulks that God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That's fine for Jonah, but Jonah doesn't want the Ninevites to share in that same love. Jonah does not want the Ninevites to get one shred of forgiveness or love from God. And so he pouts. The love isn't completely unrequited because, well, after a storm and being tossed overboard and eaten by a fish and thrown up on the beach, finally Jonah does what God asks him to do and shares the love of God. But he does so grudgingly. It is unrequited in that way. The Old Testament has the book of Hosea, a great and mighty prophet, whose chief prophecy was not a word he said, but instead the wife he took. God commanded him to go to the local brothel, the red light district, and to marry a prostitute. He married the prostitute who was completely unfaithful to him to their through their whole marriage, even when they had children, she continued to do what she'd done before they were married. And Hosea's life became a symbol, according to God, of what God's relationship with the people was like. God loved them and they were unfaithful. God loved them and poured out love in their lives only to find that they sought love in all the wrong places. Unrequited love. Even the story, the central story in the Old Testament of the Exodus, where Israel wanders after being freed, in the, freed from Egypt, is a story of people who take God's love when the water comes from the rock and the manna comes from heaven, but then complain mightily and do all sorts of thing, like, things like golden calves in order to not love God back. The Old Testament is not so much a story of punishment as a story of a God who over and over and over again does anything possible to love the people only to find that his love is unrequited. There is no doubt in Scripture that this story of God is full of love for us. In fact, nowhere else in Scripture is the love that is given to us in Jesus Christ perhaps more profound than the hymn that we hear in the second lesson today. For being in the form of God, Jesus Christ took on humanity and became a slave even to the point of death on the cross so that we might see God's love. We know that in the cross, Jesus Christ has shown us the absolute love of God, a steadfast love that will never let us go, that will hunt us down to proclaim continuing love for us. But if we examine our lives and the world that we inhabit, that love is often unrequited, it's unreturned. There are evangelists in the world who, like the second son in the parable, go around spouting with their mouths that they will indeed serve the Lord and then get caught with the pool boy. Or or they preach the gospel and then go out and buy an airplane or a football stadium or a grand house to proclaim that God has blessed them instead of serving the poor and being the last among the people. There are those who claim Christ, all talk, 
and then act as if black lives, LBGTQ lives, women's lives, refugees' lives do not actually matter. They're all siblings who talk and do not walk the love of God. They receive God's love in abundance, and yet they don't love God back. God's love for them languishes, unshared. It brings no joy or hope to the world at all. God loves us, and it goes no farther. It stops. Paul is aware of this as he speaks to the Philippians. In fact, this great hymn of God's love for us found in Jesus Christ in Philippians is not just a call to say, oh, I am so embraced and loved by God, but it becomes the reason that we share that love in the world, with one another, in creation. Paul sees that love from God is to be not unrequited, but returned and responded to. Paul tells us that to be beloved is to call for a love that's returned, a love that's shared, a love of God that changes the very world that we inhabit. He tells the Philippians to be of the same mind as Christ Jesus, who put aside everything in order to show love to the world. Listen to what he says. He says that they should, in love for God, the God who saved them, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Now, check out your social media feed. Check out the newspaper. Listen to the news. Hearken to those political ads that are all over the TV these days. Think about your relationships at work, your relationships at school, your relationships with friend. Does this describe how you share God's love? Do you do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit? Hello, candidates. But do you act in humility regarding others as better than yourselves in a world that constantly tells you that you're a loser if you're not in first place? Do each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interest of others? You see, that's what requiting the love, returning the love, responding to the love of God looks like, to act like God, to be like Jesus. My friends, we're only whole. We are only what God created us to be, which is the truth about us, not some choice we make. Well, I think I'll either follow God or I'll be this other religion or I'll just live for myself. And those are all choices I make. No, You've been created in the image of God, and until we act in the image of God, until we reflect the love of God, we will be miserable people. We will struggle between the false self, full of masks that we wear for everybody, and the true self, which illuminates the world with the love of God that's been given to us. This past week, we mourned the loss of two people, more than two, actually with COVID, that's 200,000 plus and counting. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a justice of the Supreme Court who is seen as a hero by many, many women and more than women. If if you are a woman who has a credit card in your own name, if you've been able to apply for an auto loan without your husband, if you have a financial identity within the community that is apart from any other family, thank Ruth Bader Ginsburg. If, if you are a person who has benefited because of her call to justice, then Ruth Bader Ginsburg is one of the righteous for you. Now, by all accounts, Ginsburg, who is Jewish, was not an observant Jew, perhaps a little bit like in Jesus' parable, the one who says, No, I will not go. But then did the work of the Lord anyway, was shaped by her heritage and her tradition, was shaped by the suffering of the community from which she sprang. This woman 
This woman was a light to the world who showed what it meant to love God, to love God back. She used her considerable intellect. She was called by some as the smartest person they'd ever met. She used her passion, her stubbornness, her iron will to persist. And she did so to love the world as God loved. Robert Gretz, you may not know so much, he's a Lutheran pastor who graduated from my alma mater, Trinity Seminary in Columbus, Ohio, where our intern, Matt, is from. Every year I was there, Bob Gretz would come back and speak to us. What set him apart was that Bob's first call in the late 1950s was to Montgomery, Alabama. He arrived there just after another new pastor in town had come, Martin Luther King Jr. Gretz's congregation was all black, strange for a Lutheran church in the South, but not as strange as you might think. And Gretz found himself firmly planted in the civil rights issues of Montgomery in that day. He found himself called to be part of the Montgomery bus boycott because Rosa Parks had climbed on board a bus and said she would not move. Rosa was a neighbor to Bob and Jeannie Gretz. His house was bombed. His children were threatened. He was threatened with death over and over again, and yet he marched perhaps like a son not named in the parable, who not only said, yes, Father, I will do this, but then went on to walk in the footsteps of Jesus to offer his life in service to the people he'd been given to serve. You see, Bob Gretz, whenever he talked to us, talked about God's love. This humble and effacing man of God would begin in God's grace. And then we would hear that because God has loved us, that love should be shared. It should be shared in devotion with God and returned. It should be shared with our neighbors as we love our neighbors. It should be shared with creation as we take care of the fruits of God's creative efforts. There are countless examples of those who through history have taken the love of God that's been given to them and shared it with others. That's the mission statement of our congregation, to share God's love. To not leave God as an unrequited lover, hoping that the object of God's affection will turn, come home, act, serve, and love them back. I guess that leaves the question to us. What about us? What about you? Will you be embraced by the ever-abundant love of God to the point where it begins to come out of your eyes and your mouth and your feet and your hands, out of the very pores of your body, and become something that must be shared in life? Or will you be faithful to other things? My friends, can we allow God's love to overwhelm us our mind, our soul, our spirit, and then let it overflow in love to neighbor and congregation? God's love for you is steadfast. It is forever. And there is so much of it poured out upon us that if we are to return that love, it will overflow into a world and change it. And by God, this world needs to change. So as we ponder what it means to be the object of God's steadfast love, we ask the question, will that love be unrequited or will it become the center of our lives, our devotion, our practice, our obedience? Will we love God back? Amen. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. 
Dear friends, we give thanks for the gift of baptism and for these people, one with us in the body of Christ, who are making public affirmation of their baptism. I would like to present Lucas Gerstenberger, Jack Halverson, Andrew Heckenlabel, Joey Oki, Tyler Scroggins, and Austin Soliday. I present Hayden DeWitt, Erica Espinoza, Greta Hake, Libby Loftus, Rachel Pullman, Liliana Sinclair, and Julia West. I present Preston, Connor, Cade, Blaine, Lucas, and Noah. I present Addison, Rachel, Hayden, Maya, Jonna, Lauren, and Natalie. Emma, Alexa, Carly, Marissa, and Ella. I would like to present Lauren Elgin, Jackson Fleischman, Gannon Ripley, Cole Chaden, and Jake West, who desire to make public affirmation of their baptisms. Merciful God, we give you thanks for the whom you have made your own by water and the word and baptism. You have called them to yourself. Enlighten them with the gifts of your spirit and nourish them in the community of faith. Uphold your servants and the gifts and promises of baptism and unite the hearts of all whom you have brought to new birth. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit, you give us new birth, cleanse us from sin, and raise us to eternal life. Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, stir up in Lucas the gift of your Holy Spirit. Confirm his faith, guide his life, empower him in his serving, give him patience and suffering, and bring him everlasting life. Amen. And now, uh, Andrew. Yay! You are all confirmed and members of the bodies of Christ renewed in your baptism. Let us rejoice with these brothers and sisters in Christ. Oh, congratulations to each one of you. It has been three years of intensive learning, and hopefully during these years, you've grown in relationship with each other, with members of the congregation, and also of God. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in needs. At the end of each petition, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond with, hear our prayer. Inspire all the baptized with the humble mind of Christ. Fill us so deeply with your steadfast love that our hearts overflow in love for you and obedience to your call to serve. We pray especially for the Reformed Church in America and Lutheran Chaplaincy Outreach at University Hospitals. Lord, in your mercy, Preserve and keep your creation and teach us that loving your creation is a means of loving you. Mend and redeem places that are polluted and damaged so that all of creation confesses you as Lord. In fires, flood, wind, rising oceans, and air too toxic to give life, grant us hope and the courage to act. Lord, in your mercy... 
Turn the nations toward life and away from self-serving avenues to death. Where our ways are unfair, give us new hearts and new spirits. Where sin permeates our culture and institutions, change our minds, teach us to trust your authority and obey your will. We pray especially for Poland and Romania and our own troubled nation. Lord, in your mercy. Relieve the suffering of those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit. Defend the lives and welfare of children who are abused or neglected, hungry or exploited, bullied or lonely. Grant healing to the hospitalized, especially Dick Rasmussen. Be with the homebound, especially Melva Schmidt. Comfort those who grieve, especially Artie Pearson and Carol and Lauren Williams. Lord, in your mercy. Fill this congregation with your steadfast love and guide us to share that love with our neighbors and our world. Guide us as we nurture the baptized, especially Zachary Rookie and all those who have been confirmed this month. Make us into signs of your mercy and justice for our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, We give thanks for the witness of the saints who loved you with lives of devoted service, especially Jerome, teacher and translator, Robert Gretz, reformer of society, and Stanley Bachman, beloved. By their witness, teach us to confess Jesus Christ as Lord in life and in death. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord God, the blessed Holy Trinity, who is gracious and merciful, abounding in steadfast love, embrace you and your days with peace. Amen. Go in peace, share God's steadfast love.